First Christian Church, those of you that are with us online and those that are with us in the sanctuary, good morning. It's a beautiful day here in Salem, Virginia, and we're excited to be able to come together. It's um, inspiring to see those words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and we certainly have continued to try and live up to the legacy of this vision of giving everyone who is a child of God their opportunity in our fine nation. As we worship today, I hope that we'll recognize the ways that God is working in and amongst our lives and help us to better ourselves as we come together as the people of God. So let's worship together this morning. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope for a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that you're my God you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Here I am to worship. Will you join with me in the call to worship based on the I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King, Jr.? King once had a dream, and we also have a dream, deeply rooted in our faith in God. We have a dream that, that one, one day, day this, this nation will rise up, up and live, live out, out the, true the true meaning of its creed. creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. We, we have, have a dream, dream that, that one day... day Out in the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of fellowship. Our dream that the table King referenced will be the communion table of this church. Our dream is that all of God's children will be welcomed here. That black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old spiritual. Free at last, last, free at last, last. thank God Almighty, we we are are free free at at last. Let our worship today be our commitment to this dream. We will worship in song by... Singing or humming along, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From trumpet call obey for through the mighty conflict in this his glorious day ye that are brave now serve him against unnumbered foes let courage rise in danger and strength to strength going to join together in our unity prayer, also a prayer written by Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, 
then my my living living will will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the Master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right or your left side, not for any selfish reason, I want want to be be on your your right right or your left left side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so that we can make this old world a new world. Amen. Let's join together in the prayer that our Lord taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We heard news this week about Becky McCray Brown's brother, who has taken ill with COVID and has been hospitalized this morning. So prayers for Becky McCray Brown and her family. We also continue to pray for Mike and Diana Beamer who have been fighting against COVID. She was at one point hospitalized, but is home, but they are still very ill. We continue to recognize how COVID-19 has affected individuals in our communities and our nation with a staggering loss of life to our nation, which our nation has not known in any war except for the Civil War. And so we truly are in a time of difficulty for our nation. We also want to continue lift up for our nation as we find ourselves under a new administration and for the ways that we function as a nation politically. And finally, we want to recognize the prayers of the people just in our family and friends who are facing challenges and struggles, both financial and with their relationships. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for the opportunity to come here and to be your believers, your people, your body. We come here, Lord, on this beautiful Sunday morning to come together in prayer and support and encouragement for one another. Each of us in this time of worship know of individuals in our family or our friends or neighbors or co-workers that we know are facing unique struggles, some of them related to this worldwide pandemic, some of them related to just the challenges of being humans and being a part of this world. Someone challenged with a medical crisis, we ask special prayers. For a family member we know is going through an emotional and challenging time, prayers for that individual. For someone we know that's concerned about their employment or their financial situation, special prayers. For individuals that we know of that are being challenged right now in their education, we have students who do not attend school or cannot attend school that struggle with their academic studies. Special prayers for students that are having a difficult time academically now. Finally, Lord, we pause to pray together as your people, asking that you would mold and shape us, that you would allow us to represent you in all that we do. Prayers for our fine nation as we come into a transfer of leadership. Prayers for our nation as we continue to come together to fight against this mighty pandemic. And finally, Lord, prayers for our church family. We are in unique and challenging times as people of faith. Help us to continue to work together to support one another and to be your hands and feet in this world. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name.
Thank you. Should I start over? (laughs) Okay, so where we are in our story now is that um, my young friend Jackson uh, was telling me about a special piece of artwork that he had made and his best friend in his classroom, for some reason unknown to Jackson, reached out and ripped it. And Jackson was so mad at his friend that he did not want to speak to him again. He did not want to see him again, and he knew that they could no longer be friends. And the problem that he shared with me is he said, I just feel yucky inside about it. I just feel yucky. Well, there's a story in the Bible that I want to share with you, but I'm going to share it pretty quickly. So bear with me. Follow along real quick, okay? So there's this story. It's about a man who talks to God, and God talks to the man, and God says to the man, there are these mean, wicked people over here in this city, and I want you to take this message to them. You take this message to them, and you say, look, you need to straighten up, be nice, talk to God. And this man, he said, I don't want to go to that city. Those people are mean, and they are wicked, and I don't think they should be blessed. So I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go over here. And he went so far over here, he even got on a ship. And the ship went out to sea. And then the storm came down. And the waves crashed over the ship. And he got tossed over. While he got tossed over into the ocean, this fish came up and swallowed him. And he sat in the belly of the fish three days. He was in timeout for three days in timeout. He's sitting there in time out, and he thinks, all right, clearly I have two choices. I can sit here in the belly of the fish, or I can go do what you asked me to do, God. All right, I'll go do what you asked me to do. So the fish spits him out, and he goes over to this city, and he tells all of the people, look, you need to straighten up, quit being mean, talk to God. And the people went, okay. And they did. They straightened up. They started to pray. God was pleased. Now, you would think that this man, Jonah, could now be happy, right? But you know what? Jonah wasn't happy. You know what he did? He kept marching right out of that city, and he sat down on a hill in the blazing hot sun, and he just put on a big pouty face. He was mad. He was mad because he didn't want those people to share in God's blessings. He felt like they'd been wicked and they should be in trouble. So he chose just to be mad. He chose not to be happy with those people and not to be happy with God. So there's this other part in the Bible. It's in Romans. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, and he said, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do you know why I think that's good advice? I think it's good advice because it makes us feel better on the inside. I went back and I talked with Jackson again about the problem with his friend and how yucky he felt on the inside. And he said, well, guess what? I don't feel yucky on the inside anymore. We decided we could still be friends, and now I'm happy on the inside. See, he made a decision. He made a decision that he didn't want to feel yucky on the inside anymore. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God. Dear God. Sometimes our hearts hurt. Sometimes our hearts hurt. Sometimes we feel really mad on the inside. Sometimes we feel really mad on the inside. We just feel yucky sometimes. We just feel yucky sometimes. And when that happens, and when that happens, please help us to remember, please help us to remember that we can talk with you about it. So we can feel good inside again. So we can feel good inside again. Amen.
Our scripture this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1 through 19. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy and proportion to faith, ministry and ministering, the teacher and teaching, the exhorter and exhortation, the giver and generosity, the leader and diligence, the compassionate and cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. But take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. She dies right there. The same one who's an ugly The same one that's part of the beautiful day. She dies right there. The same one who's an ugly The same one that's part of the beautiful day. Scripture says to us, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And someday I'm going to try and take out vengeance on technology that fails me. Ay, ay, (laughs) ay. I said, well, Lord, we're going to kind of base today's message on this video. And the Lord said, Dan Netting, you best be prepared for anything. I am the Lord your God. Do not be transformed. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your spirit. Some of you grew up in a tradition where you were taught to memorize scripture in Sunday school. Did anyone grow up in that tradition? Okay. I I didn't grow up in that tradition. I grew up in a tradition where Roy Roy Babinall, who was my Sunday school leader, I would come into Sunday school and he'd have the newspaper and a cup of coffee. And he'd say, sit down, boys, here's the news that I just read. We need to talk about this. And we would be in this conversation about 
who we were as Christians and who we were as modern day young people coming up in this kind of world of all kinds of modern issues. Meanwhile, others of you are memorizing scripture. I never really thought about that until I came and sort of got got into my theological studies and I came to realize that the memorization of scripture might seem kind of like an exercise for kids in Sunday school, but it has good precedence because we have a story in scripture about Jesus Christ, our Lord, being tempted by Satan. Does anyone remember that story? He goes out into the wilderness, remember? And while he's out there, he encounters, has a close encounter with Satan. And what happens is Satan tempts Jesus, and Jesus is able to repeal some of the temptations of Satan using what? Scripture. So occasionally I've asked our young people to think about memorizing some small pieces of Scripture. And this Romans passage, not the big paragraph that Aaron read, which, by the way, she did a great job, Not that big paragraph, but I reduced it to just the opening words. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your spirit. That's a very um, interesting use, word use of conforming and transforming. Now, we hear this and we say, oh, okay, well, this uh, this is probably something we can handle. But I think we need to take, give it a little more respect. Let's just give it a little bit of time. Let's think a little bit about what's being asked of us because it might not be quite as simple as you think. But before we get into that, let me just digress for a minute. We're coming into the end of January, so it's almost been a month since Christmas. I'm still going into withdrawal from Christmas. Christmas this year was not like any other Christmas. Do you all agree with me on that? And those of you that are sitting at home, one of the things that happened this year at Christmas, we're coming into Christmas and we have, I'm sure you're just like me, we have all these traditions surrounding Christmas. I mean, you know, just all sorts of things we do and say and ways that we celebrate Christmas together as the people of God. And as we came closer to that that sacred holiday and we started to realize that it wasn't going to be like other Christmases of the past, I think we all mentally said to ourselves, well, If I can't do all the traditions of Christmas, let's kind of look at maybe the most important ones. If we could only do a couple, what would those those few traditions be that are most essential, important to us for Christmas? And as we thought about that, I know kind of in my family, maybe one of the things that, you know, as the list got shortened, maybe one of the shorter things in the list was, I want to come to the Christmas Eve service. Right. And I did, I was obviously here for the Christmas Eve service. A lot of you watched the service online. The weather was not ideal. We didn't have the normal crowd that we have for Christmas Eve service. And I went home and I was sad. People who aren't involved in a church family, maybe they're just people in our nation that aren't connected to a faith body. I think a lot of them also ask the same question. And I think a lot of people came to understand that maybe the core, the most important thing that could happen at Christmas was to be with family. Do you all agree with me on that? And what was sad about the pandemic, what was really tragic, was that even that one wish to be present with another family member, your mom, your dad, many people did not even have that opportunity. I was not with my parents. Many of you were not with your parents or grandparents or brothers or sisters. And that, I think, in the end, as as I come a month away from Christmas, I'm still saying, golly, I sure missed not being able to be with my family on Christmas. You know, sometimes we might think about Christmas, and Allison is a very good Christmas gift giver, one of the best. She somehow will just make all these mental notes all during the year, and she'll have a pretty good sense of what she should purchase someone for Christmas. I, on the other hand, am not such a great Christmas gift giver. I kind of look at people and go, well, they got everything they need, so they don't need anything more, so I have no idea what to get these people, and I kind of throw my hands in the air. 
Well, Scripture today is making a really interesting statement, and it's kind of making it about God. If we imagine getting a gift for a family member or friend, and we're somewhat puzzled over what to get the person who has everything, imagine if we were to try and wonder if we were purchasing a gift for God. Let's get something for God. Well, that's a good idea. I mean, we love God, and God is our Father in heaven. Let's get something for God. But what do you get for God who made everything? Hmm. And so I guess the answer is, according to scripture, what we just read today, is the best gift you could give God who has everything is you. You are a walking gift to God. But that seems almost too simple. It seems maybe like that can't be the right answer. But today, Romans points us right to that premise. It says, let yourself be a living sacrifice. Let your body be the ultimate gift to God and to our world. But in order to do that, in order to give God this gift, which is you, the problem is you can forget who you is. You can get lost in the who you are in this world. And the world kind of wants you to get a little bit lost in the who you are. And the way that the world does that is it spends a whole lot of time and effort and money, millions and millions of dollars, trying to tell you who you are. And it's pretty good at it. Recently, and you won't be surprised by this, this isn't even exciting news, this isn't even surprising, but... When you think about it, it might be surprising. Recently, I was getting gas, and I had gone up to the gas pump, which was a smart gas pump, as all of them seem to be, and I put my debit card in there, and it asked for my PIN, and I put my PIN on the screen, and I pulled out my debit card, and I started pumping my gas, and guess what happened next? You're just not going to believe what happened next. Yes, you are. The screen that you that housed my debit card turned into a TV screen. Have you ever seen this? So while I'm pumping my gas, all of a sudden what was just something that had the function of being able to have a four-digit PIN number became a mechanism for me to once again learn about different products I should be purchasing. And wrapped into the advertisement is also this premise of who I should be so that I purchase the correct products to be the person I need to be. I'm just trying to get gas in my car. Is anyone surprised by that story? We're not. We're not surprised at all. Because we live in a culture where all day long we have mechanisms where advertisement is constantly telling us who we should be. And woven into these products that we're supposed to purchase are assumptions of who we are and who we aren't and why we need to have a certain product. And woven into that is the dilemma that we are supposed to, based on Scripture, live in a world where we allow ourselves to be shaped by the will and direction of God, not by a person that's advertising to us. So this passage of Scripture Again, beginning with this simple idea that we should not conform to the world, but we should allow ourselves to be transformed by Christ is not as simple as it might sound. It's not as easy, and in a a way, it could become our lifelong mission of just trying to figure out how to not simply be a robot that is vulnerable to all whims and advertisements that come out of the gas pump. So we, we might set ourselves on a direction of saying, I want, to, I want to listen to God's word, and I want to make sure that I'm not just in a position of doing what advertising tells me to do. But the problem is that this is much more challenging than it seems on the surface. And one of the reasons why it's so challenging is that when we think about this passage of Scripture, what it suggests is that we are all one body. We're all part of a body. And scripture is saying that every part of the body is important. And I've already laid down the premise that the greatest gift we can give God is us. 
But so often, what we want to give God is what we think we should be, the most important thing we should be. And Scripture is really careful to remind us that if we're all this one body, that all the members, all the parts of the body are important. But based on the morals and values of our world, that's not the way it works. In our world, we look at a body and we can quickly identify the parts of the body that are more important. Namely, the brain is number one. Your mind has got to be the most important thing. And then maybe followed by your heart, which then gives blood to your brain. Maybe followed by lungs, which feeds the heart, which helps your brain. So we already, in our minds, we have this schematic of parts of the body that are more important. And maybe that is based on biology or our logic. But scripture here is solidly saying that all the members of the body are important. Now, if we cannot really truly embrace that concept, then when we go to give ourselves to God, we will present to God this facade of who we are in hopes of trying to be important enough for God. And what happens is, Scripture says, that if we all do that, then all we end up with is a whole bunch of hands when we really need an eye. We end up with a whole bunch of mouths when we really need a foot. And so part of the the message for today is a message to all of us that we, the way we were made and who we are, is an important gift for God, just the way you are. Not trying to conform to what you think the world says you should be. You got me? Now, when we listen to this, we say, well, it sounds easy enough, sounds logical enough, shouldn't be a big problem. But you should always be suspect of the fact that when we read Scripture, we might initially think it doesn't sound like such a hard assignment. But guess what? If it was an easy assignment, we would have done it a long time ago. But we don't. And one of the problems with what's being said in Romans today is that woven into the message this morning is a necessary element for change that I think is very lacking in our society today. In order for us to take the concept of God's equity for all people, we have to, and it sounds really cliche when we kind of mention Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, But let me remind you that part of the mechanism of making Jesus the Lord is that we have to be very intentional about not making ourselves the Lord. And so we can sometimes kind of forget that we are to put ourselves below Christ. We are to humble ourselves behind the will of our Lord. And so when we are in this position of trying to find our place in this world, to be the proper person we are, we have to approach that with the humility of saying, God, I'm willing to be used how you want to use me. Now, we can say, I don't want to be a hand. I I, I don't want to be a toe. I don't want to be an eye. We can come into what the Lord gives us. He gives us such diverse and beautiful gifts. But we can say to ourselves, my gift is not what it should be. or My gift is less. Or even bigger than just your gifts, we can start to say the same thing, same thing about our churches and about the people God brings together. Even within the body of Christ, we start to say, well, within this body of Christ, there are people who are more important to God in his mission, and there are people that are less important to God in his mission. And a common place where we would see that historically is just a simple division, not even complex, between adults and children. In Jesus' day, children were considered to be much less human than adults. And so that was just seemed really not natural. They're tiny and they're not as strong and their brains aren't completely developed. And so back in Jesus' culture, it was considered that children needed to be not seen and not in the way. And then we have this beautiful passage of Scripture where Jesus suggests, what? Let the children come to me. And he sits a child on his lap in the middle of a sermon, 
And people say, well, that was a good sermon until you took it away by putting this kid on your lap. And now we don't even know what's going on. And why are you doing that? And Jesus says, because this child is just as important as you adults. And we, we've heard this story so many times from Jesus. But now we live in a society where we need to hear this story in a new way. Because we don't have divisions. We might find ourselves to be much more developed than that. We say, we know children are important. And we embrace youth. And we know that everyone has a place in this body. But be aware that when we hear these words, do not be conformed to this world. That all of us listening today online and here in the sanctuary are vulnerable to being people who are conformed to the ways of this world. We have within our structure and our psychology the ability to judge and categorize people in seconds upon meeting them. We have to become good students of the fact that it's easy for us to make people less. It is easy for us to put judgments on people. We live in a society that has been structured to make certain people more important, other people less important. This is what Romans is speaking to us today. It's asking us this fundamental question. Can you humble yourself enough to let Christ realign the ways you think about people? There is no one in our sanctuary today or listening online who was not made by God for a purpose. There is no one who's listening today who is disposable, who is not important to completing the mission of Christ in this world. We all have a place at the table. And that's what today's passage is reminding us. If you are listening and you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, that's really not a problem for me. I love everyone. I'm you know, kind to all people. I don't care within me judgments. I think that that is a statement that is arrogant. I think we all struggle with this issue. Every single one of us. This past week, there was a statement made that was almost a bit shocking when I first heard it. The statement was that democracy is fragile. And I've been to Washington, D.C., and I've seen big buildings in Washington, D.C., and I've been told to stand here and don't go there and do this and don't do that. I never once would have thought of anything about that system being fragile. And yet someone was bold enough to make that statement. Democracy is fragile. And so if we know something's fragile and it needs protection, who protects it? Who keeps it from falling apart if it's fragile and the answer that we were given this past week is we all do all of us and in the same way i believe in theological ways that our church is a fragile thing and it stands together by every single one of us going to scripture and studying scripture to learn how we can also make sure we are part of this body you know the funniest thing about today's passage and it, it'll just make everyone kind of laugh, but it's so true. You have a strong body. It's functioning fine. But have you ever gotten a hangnail? Have you ever sliced your pinky? And all day long, your whole day can be derailed by a slice in your pinky? Does it ever happen? You've got respect in your eye, and all day long, your eye's watering, and it throws off your entire day? Have you ever stubbed your toe on the couch on the way out the door, and all day long, your day is derailed by a single stubbed toe? Who are we? We're bigger than a toe. We're bigger than a pinky. You know, deal with the speck. We can be derailed by even the smallest of people who is cast aside. We have to either be strong together as a body, or we will also find ourselves broken as a body. When I was a kid at camp, I learned a song. You've learned it too. You can't, the song is really beautiful. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. Everyone knows that song, or maybe you learned it years ago when you went to church camp. Is it true that I am the church? Yes. Is it true you're the church? Yes. 
Is it true that together we become that church? Yes. But you know, we've learned in recent weeks that I am the nation and you are the nation. And you know, we are this nation together. And as we continue to envision a God who is the God of all people, we come to realize that I am the world and you are the world. And together, we are a world family. This is the vision of this body for all people. Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen. And as we come to this table, we remind ourselves each and every Sunday that this table is our way of worshiping this passage of Scripture, that everyone is invited to this table, that together we are all one family. So let us worship and come to this table in communion. A little girl went to the park with her dad. And you wouldn't believe all the fun that they had. They went on the slide. And they went on the swings. They climbed up the trees and did lots of other fun things. After playing for a while, it was time for a snack. They sat down on a bench and the girl opened her backpack. She reached inside and said, oh looky! It was a great big chocolate chip cookie. She picked up the cookie and broke off a chunk. But then she looked up and saw a cheery chipmunk. Oh, hi, little chipmunk. Are you hungry, too? Well, this little piece can be just for you. The girl broke off another small bite when a bouncy birdie came into her sight. Oh, hi, little bird. Are you hungry, too? Well, this little piece can be just for you. She broke off another piece just like that. But someone was watching her. It was a curious cat. Oh, hi, little cat. Are you hungry, too? Well, this little piece can be just for you. Now the cookie was small and it would be all gone soon. But then the girl noticed a rowdy raccoon. Oh, hi, little raccoon. Are you hungry, too? Well, this last piece can be just for you. After she gave her cookie away, her father didn't quite know what to say. You can share if you want. I don't mind. But wasn't that cookie your favorite kind? It's only a chocolate chip cookie, she replied. I'm not really sad and I'm not going to cry. I do like cookies very much, you see. But I love those around me even more. That matters the most to me. Let us pray. 
As we take this bread, let us remember the words in Philippians which say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthen me. Let each of us call upon the strength to lead a truly Christian life in the week ahead. Amen. And these words from Christ. For I receive what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and blessed it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray again. As we take this cup, let us think about the gifts the Lord has blessed us with. And yes, we all have some gifts. And let us share those with the people around us this week. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Offering is, in a way, simple, and it's as simple as the video that we saw about the little girl. It made perfect sense when she saw an animal to share her cookie. And it makes perfect sense for those of us that have been richly blessed to share what we have with others in need. So every Sunday, we always remind ourselves of the importance of giving. So let us continue to support our church financially so that we can do these good works. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. As we close today, it is an opportunity for us to remind ourselves of the importance that we have of all being a part of this wonderful process called the body of Christ. And I hope that each of us will reflect on the ways that God should and can use us. So let us close together with our closing hymn. as we go into the world, we ask that each one of us can be a point of light in a sometimes dark world. We ask, Lord, that you can allow us to let our light shine, to make this world thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we close today with the Spirit song. Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with His Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let Him have the things that hold you and His Spirit like 
God will descend upon. 